The brief is, is come along, give a, give a quick introduction to, to who we are, uh, come along with a couple of uh, uh, current challenges in, in, um, in uh, large data exploitation and, and data visualisation, uh, both now and sort of you know, forward-looking for, for, for future challenges. And I presume because this is an industry panel, we should be sort of looking at more of the, the industry take of the industry side of things. So if I, if I start with giving a, a, a brief introduction to myself, so I'm the Chief Science Officer of a, of a company called uh, Eagle Genomics. We've been going for a few years, uh, seven years in, in, in Cambridge. We're a bioinformatics consultancy company, uh, and we uh, do a lot of work with uh, open source uh, software that's emerging from the places like the EBI and the Sanger Institute. And so my background has been very much uh, within uh, the, 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 sort of the data visualization realm. So I started off as, a, as an environmental scientist uh, looking at uh, satellite imagery uh, and also modeling of these, uh, 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 modeling of uh, um, shelf C uh, uh, models for, for chlorophyll produ productivity to try to correlate the, the, the satellite images with the, with the models. And, and the, the Im imagery and the, and, and the plots and the visualization we were looking at at that time, back in the mid 90s, is very much sort of these static images uh, uh, type of approach. Uh, and then in, 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 in sort of early, uh, early in the new millennia, uh, I moved over to the, the, the genomics world, uh, working on the Ensemble product, project. And at that time, it was more, moved away from analyzing images and more into um, programming the, the, the software for the visualization itself, so the, 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 uh, the Ensemble Genome Browser. Um, and also the, the, the Ensemble Gene Trees was something I was, I was responsible for doing. Um, and so the, that was the movement from these sort of very static type of images into sort of these much more d dynamic web frameworks, uh, if you like. Um, and so after this sort of time at, 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 the, at the Sanger Institute and, and Cold Spring Harbor, uh, we, we started uh, Eagle Genomics. And what we're really seeing now is in this sort of post-genomic world, we're trying to make sense of multi-omics uh, measurements and integrating things together, and you're now starting to look at big networks. So I think these sort of, this sort of progression is both from this sort of the, the static images uh, through to the, to, to the key paradigms of visualization in the molecular biology space, which is the genome browsers and graphs, things like the, the, these gene trees are graphs. And now the, the, the state we've got to now is these very, very large, complex network graphs. Uh, and, and that's where I really think we are right now. Um, but one thing, it, it, it kind of strikes me that, that, that there hasn't been a huge amount of progress since so 2005, uh, around, around that time when the genome browsers started and the web technology started, there hasn't been that much progress in new paradigms for data visualization in molecular biology. We're still using very much the same sort of paradigms that we were back then. And because I had this sort of long-standing interest in, 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 in the visualization realm, uh, a year ago I, did, I, I set up this, this uh, uh, meetup group. So this is a, a, a meetup group that meets in Cambridge once every quarter. And it's about trying to get the community, both the biological community and also the, the, the computer science community in Cambridge together in an informal setting to try to sort of examine and look at the... the, the, uh, the um, the, the field of visualization and, 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 and to see what, what commonalities there are. And the first thing, the first one that we held uh, a, 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 um, almost a year ago now was the key challenges. And you know, we're, we're up to sort of 200 odd, 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 odd people have registered for this, for this meeting, and we're getting about 50 people to each, to each meeting. Um, so, now to, in terms of the remit of, of, of this particular, um, uh, particular meeting, what we've been asked to do is to, is to come up with some, some key challenges. So we ha held this meeting and some, some things came up. And really the, the current challenges I think that we have is the first thing is that there are some new technologies coming along. Web technologies are changing very fast in computer science. But using those new technologies in these legacy systems like Ensemble is actually a very, very challenging, uh, it's a very challenging thing to do to retrofit these new technologies. And how do we exploit these new technologies? I think that is a, a, a real current challenge. And also, I think it's very significant is how, how do you obtain funding, so grant funding for open source software for these sort of visualization development projects? And I think that is a real challenge at the moment. Uh, looking forwards, what do we see the, where do we see the field moving in the, in, in the, next, uh, in the next few years? Um, it, it, it strikes me that, that, that now is a really good time for some new paradigms for data visualization and molecular biology. We're moving from this sort of linear 
reference genome to more of these genome graphs, these, 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 these um, the pan genomes and these genome graphs, and, and how are visualization technologies going to sort of allow those to be used in the same way that we use genome browsers now? That's a very much an unsolved challenge. And also, nowadays, that these data sets are very, very large, and they're too large to bring together and consolidate in one place. So I really think that there's a, that there's, there's a, a, a real need for new technologies that, that support sort of visual analytics across very large federated data sets. Okay, so that's my, 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 my current challenges and future challenges. Okay, so thanks very much. So, uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Pathiban Vijayanakannan. So, I'm, uh, uh, I'm the CEO of uh, uh, Cambridge Gene, um, a startup um, we are in Cambridge. Uh, we are based at the Future Business Center. Um, so, my history, uh, my history is I started working with uh, protein structural bioinformatics long, long ago uh, in the early millennia. So um, I started using uh, plain old uh, uh, systems, uh, silicon graphic systems, uh, and with IRIX, that's, that's an old version of Unix, uh, to visualize protein structures. We even had like special devices to rotate the structures <laughs> in those states. Um, the visualization uh, problem itself hasn't changed a lot uh, during these years. Although the systems, the technology that we are using uh, is uh, changing rapidly, uh, new programs are coming, new technologies are coming, it's more uh, web-oriented nowadays uh, as opposed to the, uh, the, the, uh, those days. And then ca uh, came the applets, um, uh, so which can be deployed in the web, and then now uh, we are slowly moving to the uh, JavaScript world, uh, and then I think there is a good reason for that. So um, I'll briefly explain the technology problem uh, uh, in, in generic terms. Um, so, um, uh, so I'm not going to uh, talk about very old systems like Silicon Graphics, uh, but you know, compared to the the recent, uh, uh, more recent uh, technology like Java, uh, Java applets and, and other things, or, or desktop applications and so on. So these are very difficult to deploy um, uh, and, and distribute um, and uh, make them available to everyone. So um, except for the Java applets that, that had uh, lots of security issues, uh, which became a, an issue. Uh, so now th that's why we need a new newer technology uh, uh, like JavaScript, uh, so that can um, address all these issues. Uh, one of the other uh, uh, technology problem uh, for for any application in this area is uh, the speed and the memory footprint. Uh, I have say, seen uh, web-based technology using JavaScript that 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 was very very slow uh, in loading in. Uh, nearly all of the browsers, um, even in uh, th these, these technologies were used by commercial applications uh, uh, as well. So, uh, so uh, we have to kind of uh, contain the memory foot footprint even in the browser to, to make it uh, uh, load faster, make it uh, like handle very large data sets and then keep them uh, uh, memory low. The other issue that we are dealing with is um, where do we have the data? So, or where can we have the data? So, can we? Can you have the data in your desktop? Um, so, can, uh, in, uh, can you have a very large genome, a, a BAM file, or FOSQ file, which is like a terabytes of storage in in, in your desktop? So, uh, the answer is very clear. Uh, it's very simple. No, uh, it's uh, not at all possible to have uh, very large data in your desktop. So it usually uh, the data um, uh, uh, in most cases nowadays uh, uh, it lives the server, yeah, in a, in a remote server, and there is like a backend application, a software that opens the data, um, uh, kind of do some processing, and then sends it over the internet, and then it makes you visualize that data very very quickly. So um, I think uh, other technologies uh, like, like desktop applications cannot address this problem. So um, JavaScript can address this problem, and we are in a much better position with BioJS. Yeah. So uh, obviously, the user interface uh, design and visual appeal, it is common for all, all applications. And I think uh, JavaScript um, is much better at that. And it uh, and and being interactive, it's also uh, getting much better at that. You know, I don't go into all those things. One of the other technology problem that um, 
many people don't realize, but uh, it is getting there, is that um, before visualizing the data, we have to do some pre-compute with the data. So uh, the primary data may be very huge. You know, like you may be uh, looking at a few reads of DNA from a very large genomic genome file. You know, so and then you have to pull that uh, those reads and then send them across the internet, and then uh, not not a hundred gig BAM file, but only those like tiny amount of data. So. Uh, in, in which case we have to convert the primary data into a secondary data, much smaller data, so that we can easily load in a, in a, in a browser and visualize. So pre-compute is, is very, very important. Or uh, This may also involve analysis. What is really difficult, uh, a big challenge now is, once you visualize the data using JavaScript, BioJS, uh, or, or any application, and then suddenly you realize that you know you have to change the parameters, you know, and then revisualize it. Then it requires recompute, you know, like so. Um, and then the recompute ideally has to happen really, really fast, so that you do the compute and then visualize the data. So this is still a big challenge, uh, even in the genomics world, uh, even in the JavaScript world. So, so that's um, I'll. Uh, leave it there. So we haven't solved that problem fully, but we are slowly getting there with uh, various ways uh, of uh, uh, addressing this problem. And obviously, the massive data and visual analysis is, is a common problem uh, in the genomics world, uh, as well as in many cases in system biology or, or, or proteomics and so on. Yeah. So uh, that was the technology problem, and I think um, once again it's a, it's a bird's eye view of uh, how BioJS can handle or already handling this, these problems or, or issues. Uh, so we need next uh, next gen methods, um, not only for new data, new types of data, but even for for all types of data. You know, um, we used to visualize uh, protein structures in, in in silicon graphics, but that's no longer possible. We need to have some kind of very fast JavaScript visualization uh, for the same thing. For example, multiple sequence alignment. Yeah. So uh, BioJS is already having a module for that, uh, but you know, it, it's, we still have to develop uh, a new technology uh, in the new platform like uh, BioJS uh, that addresses plain old issues. You know, um, and when, when we deal with new types of data, we simply forget uh, that we we don't have modules for for plain old issues. Yeah. We are uh, actually having this issue right now. So like, we need a new technology for handling plain old issues in a, in a brand new platform. Yeah. And it has to be designed for the web. So usually when we develop uh, uh, applications, industry develop applications, it can be uh, over the internet. So um, our uh, potential customer can, or customer can use over the internet. Um, that's one possibility, but it is also uh, very important that we can deploy internal applications, uh, <coughs> browser-based applications uh, that uh, run uh, our web application that run internally in, in, a, in a client's network, in a pharma company, pharmaceutical company's network, for, a, for instance. Yeah, because uh, the pharma companies usually don't prefer sharing their data to the outside world, and and also they have to uh, uh, answer millions of questions to. Um, uh, uh, IP attorneys uh, on you know like what data they actually shared and, and is it confidential and so on. So even in those cases, you know we have to kind of um, um, address this uh, issue with the BioJS or, or any other JavaScript-based technology. So obviously uh, we we like to develop a, a single application that can run over the internet or internally. So so obviously this has to be a browser-based application nowadays. Uh, and it, it has to be a single component, ideally. So that can be reused in both ways. Yeah. And mod modular, uh, but I think BioJS is already uh, handling this. So uh, not everyone requires ev everything in BioJS. So we have to uh, split them into uh, uh, modular components. So we can use whatever we want, and we can exclude um, uh, other things. Yeah. And the other th two things um, uh, that are very important is um, even the industry, uh, in my opinion, strongly believes in open source, except in some cases, except in, um, you know, 
BioJS is, is, an, is an important example. So that is not where the industry uh, does innovation. So in, in, innovates, uh, I mean, if we try to develop uh, an excellent BioJS or a JavaScript module for over uh, several years, it may be nice, but you know, we have to do other things. You know, we have to develop functionalities and so on. And this is more of an academic issue. You know. So it has to be open source. But the uh, final thing, um, a fle flexible software license, I'm also talking on behalf of my friends here. So uh, there are uh, different types of uh, software licenses, even for open source software. So there are some licenses that stop us from using the software. You know, for example, uh, a GPL version 2 may, may, may or, or, or in some uh, licenses, um, expect us to release our source code, you know, not, not just the source code related to BioJS or, or the module itself, but you know, anything that is written uh, for functionality from us has to be open source as well. So this is not ideal for, for industry, you know, because that's the only thing we sell sometimes. You know? So um, a flexible open source software license for commercial use is also very important. Yeah. So with that, um, I finish my talk. Thank you. Hi guys, uh, I'm Adrian. I'm co-founder and CTO at Repositive, and uh, we are louder. Okay, I'll try to talk louder. Um, uh, we are a young startup in Cambridge. We 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 are thinking about solutions. So we, we we're uh, trying to come up with solutions of how to better um, access genomic data, ethical data sharing. Um, how, how we can make this data more uh, accessible to researchers. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a visualization uh, person per se, so I, I did my computer science, uh, I'm a computer scientist, I would say now probably more data scientist. I, I like a lot thinking about algorithms, data structures, APIs, so on. Um, I spent some time at Max Planck in the computational biology and uh, applied algorithmics group, and that's where I went into more into the biotech uh, thing. I was doing a lot of enrichment analysis at that point. After that, I moved at Illumina, and I went into uh, sequencing. And at Illumina, I kind of tried to combine a bit more uh, my interest <laughs> in uh, data structures, how to uh, how to do analytics on the data, and uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, the uh, the genomics. So I worked on a lot of uh, in in-house analytical platforms. I I spent some time on BaseSpace, which is Illumina cloud computing uh, platform. And uh, one year ago, I moved. Uh, I quit my job at Illumina and I joined the the Repository venture. Um, a bit more about my background on the on the open source uh, side of thing. I was um, the, the, the ones of you that work with R and are using a lot of uh, Bioconductor tools know that Bioconductor is a very nice uh, library of, um, of um, bioinformatics tools. So I, I'm a strong, I was a strong supporter, I mean still is, I don't have time to work on it, but I, I, I'm a strong supporter of Bioconductor and I contributed with a couple of things there. So I, I, I wrote a package called TopGeo, which was like enrichment analysis on gerontology, and there were some visualizations issues there as well that I, I really enjoyed working on. Um, and when I was at Illumina, I worked on the, uh, I came up with BasePacer, which basically was, uh, the main idea was to bridge the uh, base space platform to the bioconductor community and try to make uh, easier the life of bioconductor contributors to bring their applications to base space. Um, so uh, moving uh, on towards the visualization part, um, what I think and what we think at Repositive it's, uh, it's needed right now from, a, from an industry point of view there is more and more and more genomic data generating because the cost of sequencing is getting super cheap. So the need we see is like how one will um, be able to um, explore large uh, cohorts of genomic data 
like how how do you visualize the data properties? How do you how do you uh, visualize queries on this data? I mean, we we definitely need fast and uh, intuitive uh, visualization tools to to empower the uh, researchers and clinicians to find out uh, genetics causes markers and to to drive the diagnostics and therapeutics further. Um, what we do at Repositive, um, we are trying to provide tools for efficient data access, a large, loud, uh, large cohorts of genomic data, which basically uh, will um, mention in the as a as a um, future um, challenge. Uh, we care a lot about uh, usability, so we care about like clean design. We care about like how do you uh, how do you provide uh, the information from the data, so meaningful information for the data, how, how, how a researcher can extract the most knowledge from, from, the, from those data sets. Um, there are, if you think about doing analytics a large, uh, across large cohorts of uh, genomic data sets, there are uh, few ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, projects and Probably the most relevant here would be 23andMe, which they have huge amount of data sets. Basically, probably now they have around one uh, one million uh, individuals in there, and they are working now on what they call research uh, portal, which is a way of doing analytics and looking at statistics and looking at frequency of variants across all this all this genomic data. So you have 23andMe, you have like. Um, uh, the Exome, uh, Exome Aggregation Consortium, Nextcode, has a very powerful platform, uh, and you can do some other things. So, just to uh, quickly sum up, um, basically what I would like to bring up and what I would like you guys to think is uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheels. I mean, the industry should not always come up with, n like, new pieces of software to visualize the same kind of data and so on and so forth. So the idea is like, can we come up with like open source components in, let's say in BioGS or Bioconductor or any other visualization thing that will allow, uh, let's say industry and research and academic users to kind of build dashboards, uh, build applications to visualize um, large cohorts of data. So that's my, uh, that's me. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I am uh, Rebecca Lawrence. I'm managing director of a publishing company called F1000 Research Limited. So I'm gonna come at this at a very different angle to what you've uh, heard so far. Uh, and I'm gonna talk particularly about how it f uh, data visualization relates to the issues around reproducibility. Very briefly, uh, just uh, summarize who we are. Uh, so uh, faculty of 1,000 uh, has been going about 12, 13 years now. We have a large faculty, about 11,000 experts across biology and medicine uh, that oversee everything we do. Um, one of the things we sort of historically uh, have uh, done um, is article uh, recommendations uh, through the F1000 Prime service. We also recently just launched a whole suite of tools to enable uh, uh, researchers to manage references, discover new references, uh, web-wide annotation and authoring using all of that information. Um, and we also have F1000 Research, which is an open science publishing platform, which is obviously uh, what I'll uh, talk about briefly here. Um, uh, and so those are the, the three main things that we uh, focus on. Uh, very briefly, F1000 Research is a very different way of publishing. We use an immediate publishing and transparent peer review model. So we publish first, then completely open, transparent, invited refereeing. We have no editorial bias, which means we publish all kinds of findings, including small and, and findings, negative results, data notes, software tools, all those kind of things. But the key other thing that, that really relates to what 
talking about here is that we have a mandatory policy in terms of the data and the software. So uh, we think it's essential that if the findings are out there, you need to be able to see the data that it's based on so you can actually try and reuse it and replicate it. So at least my next point, which is really around uh, the reproducibility issue. I'm sure most of you here are aware of uh, the many discussions going on around the problems of reproducibility. Uh, there was a big paper, obviously, back in 2012 in Nature, where a group at Amgen tried to replicate 53 landmark cancer papers. And they found they could only completely reproduce six of them which is 11%, which is a really scary statistic. And a number of other groups have tried similar kind of studies, found similar kind of results. There's a whole set of reasons why this is the case. Some of them about how the studies are done and about you know, failure to adhere to good scientific practice. And there's a whole raft of issues around there. Some of it's about the whole publish and perish culture, about actually designing experiments in a way that you know, enables you to build a nice story that makes it a bit more impactful because you can get it into a top uh, journal, which then helps your next grant, helps your, your career and, and, um, and potential for tenure and all those kind of things. So there's a whole set of issues around that. But there's also a whole set of issues around the fact that in most cases, the data behind the articles is still not shared. It's improving and journals are getting stronger policies around this, but an awful lot of the time it's still not shared. And even if it is, it's usually in a format that you can't reuse, you can't understand. Um, and an awful lot of the, the methods aren't shared as well. And it's actually pretty important that you understand the detail of the protocol that went behind it. As I say, a number of journals are addressing it. Uh, eLife have been doing uh, quite a number of, of uh, uh, projects around this area, and Ian may well mention some of them later, but around things like registered reports, for example, so registering what you're going to do before you do the study so you can check that you're reporting on it properly, uh, and also encouraging people to try and reproduce findings and to publish them. Um, and uh, uh, as I have on here, you know, the NIH are getting very worried about it and doing a lot of uh, work looking at this. And this is an example of you know, where replication is really important. Many of you, I suspect, have probably seen this paper we published uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, reanalyzing the mouse and code uh, data and finding serious problems with it. Um, and in fact, part of the data uh, was uh, released uh, previously, but even when more data was asked for, more of the protocol information was asked for, uh, there were still uh, concerns about some of that data. As I mentioned, it's not just about sharing the data. It's about making sure that we've got detailed protocol information. It's crucial that you understand that, you know, maybe you span it for three minutes instead of one, or you, you know, all those kind of details that make a big difference to whether you can reproduce the finding. There's the issues around making sure that the data is in an understandable and in a reusable format. Obviously, for computational studies, it's understanding the environment that it's meant to uh, be in. And of course, replication actually is really time consuming and really expensive. You know, in a wet lab uh, experiment, there's not really an easy way around it. You have to do the experiment again, you have to get the reagents, and it takes a long time. Computational studies, there are things that can be done to improve it, where within the article, you can actually start to have the environment there to enable you to, to not have to set all of that up. And there are some projects now uh, working on enabling that, working out how you would actually uh, do that. And then there's the whole peer review of data. You know, it's all very well having the data, um, but you know, it's taking the time to actually peer review it and understand whether that data backs up uh, the conclusions. And therefore, often, even when the data's there, the peer review uh, isn't necessarily uh, done. Um, so we've done a number of things working on trying to improve some of these issues. Um, this is an example, this is a paper from Manny from a while back, um, which, uh, so for all our, it's a, it's a good example, for all the data that we have, um, we uh, work with a number of groups, Figshare is one of the main ones, uh, to enable the data itself to be previewable within the article. So you don't have a link that just says it's over there, go and have a look at it. Uh, this is actually a really big data set, it's about uh, 11 gigabytes, I think. But you can preview it, you can see, you know, is this something that I'm interested in looking at? If you don't happen to have a BAM viewer, you can still see it. You don't have to go and find a viewer to have a look at it. And also, very interestingly, you know, it captures information about the interest in the data set. And actually here, you know, it's been downloaded almost 200 times. A lot of people say, well, we don't, what's the point of sharing their data? A lot of people aren't looking at it. But actually, a lot of people are looking at it and are reusing it. Taking it a bit further, I talked about peer review and, and peer review of data. Um, 
So we did some work. We built a very simple uh, little data plotter tool, uh, which works on spreadsheet data. So about, I think uh, Microsoft did a study a while about looking at uh, research data, and about 70% of research data is spreadsheet. So we thought, well, this is a good place to start. Um, going back to the peer review point, it's all very well having a big spreadsheet, but if you don't know what's in it, then you know, there's not a lot you can do with it unless you download it and put it in your own software and play around with it. So we built this little tool, uh, which allows you to just see what's in there. So the authors submitted that uh, data. You can see at the bottom. This is working very well. Um, and then it plots it. And then you can say, so this is a, a controlled trial. Um, so you can say, actually, I'd rather look at uh, drug dose and have a look at how it affects a couple of parameters. So you select those options, click refresh, and you get something like that. So immediately you can see, you know, you can have a look at the, the uh, results and the, the analysis and the conclusions that they've come up with in the paper and say, you know, if they'd said drug dose increases these parameters, you can see straight away, well, actually, no, it doesn't. Or you can see if there's outliers and they've deliberately excluded them or, or otherwise. You can get a very quick assessment as to whether, they've, whether their conclusions match um, the data that they've provided. Taking it a step further, uh, we worked with a couple of authors, Bjorn Brems and Julian Colomb, uh, in this paper, because really, you know, the figures are obviously a, a single plot of the data. And really, you need the data and the code to analyse it. And then, as a reader or a referee, to be able to play with it, adjust parameters within it and see what happens and, and adjust it. This is a very simple proof <coughs> of principle here. Um, but basically, this, when you go to this article, it computes this figure on the fly. And then there, in, there's a little drop down on the left there. Uh, it's different types of whisker plots. You can say, okay, I want to adjust that, and you get a slightly different plot. So I'll say it's a proof of principle, but it shows that you can you know, start to do this within the article and quickly just get a quick <coughs> assessment of what's going on. If you take this one step further again, uh, in the same paper, uh, the authors uh, worked with us to create this living figure. So this goes back to the whole reproducibility issue, um, where actually other labs have tried to reproduce these experiments and have submitted their data directly onto this figure, which then updates in time. So you can see on the top up there, you can see the different dates and different groups that people have added things. You can see at the bottom exactly who's added it, when. You can even download the separate bits of data. You can cite the separate data. And then if you adjust, on the drop down, you go just to one of the other dates, you can see how the graph changes and you can go backwards and forwards in time and see how things add and see whether other labs, for example, have been able to reproduce this. Uh, again, you know, this is an example of where there's all sorts of things you could do with this. You could plug it directly into a sort of standing search on a database and as new things come into the database, the figure updates and keeps it living and you can see how things are growing. So it really has potential to, to change how we publish and how we share uh, information. Okay, so talking about challenges, so we've done a number of these kind of things like I showed, but there are a whole raft of challenges around trying to do them. One is generally uh, the research community, there's still a lack of awareness in terms of data formatting requirements and how to structure it. So we spend a lot of time working with authors to make sure it's, you know, computation will be mineable and that it makes sense, people can understand what's going on. There's also often a lack of programming expertise in a lot of research groups generally. Um, it's, it's worse, I mean, we obviously cover all of biology and medicine, and obviously it's much worse on the medical side where, you know, a lot of this would be very useful as well. But even in the biology side, uh, there are some areas where uh, there's still a lack of the expertise to enable us to do this kind of thing. The quality of the code is definitely an issue, um, even working with groups that have, you know, <laughs> good programmers, uh, when it comes down to having it stable enough and, you know, without bugs and working at a level that we could actually put and publish, uh, spent, we spent a huge amount of time working with them on making sure we got to that point. And the problem really of that is that often this code isn't reusable. So it works perfectly for that particular type of study to do those kind of particular types of plots. But really, it needs to be scalable. It needs to be able to be used on certain different types. And one of the issues is there's a lack of standards in a lot of places. And there's also a vast number of data types and a vast number of different types of things that you want to do with it. Um, and so it does cause a problem with that. 
for a lot of publishers, they have complex publishing systems that are licensed in, and it makes it incredibly hard for them to actually adjust and adapt those platforms. Um, we're incredibly lucky that we built our own, and so we can do what we want when we want, um, but that's not very often the case. Um, we just talked about the whole open source issue, but obviously a lot of industry-built code uh, isn't necessarily open source, and obviously that's a bit of a challenge. Um, and also, there's some fantastic visualization tools, but a lot of them you can't actually embed within the article. And again, that's a problem because you're sending somebody off to have to go somewhere else to play around with it, and that's a, a barrier to people really analyzing it. Okay, I'll just quickly finish um, w uh, just to mention that we do have a BioJS uh, collection, which Manny and Tatiana Goldberg uh, edit, uh, to capture a lot of these visualization elements. Um, and so we look forward, obviously, to, to it being an a expanding uh, a collection of these elements and, and issues. Okay, thank you. You didn't mention another uh, thing that came to my mind as a challenge, which is the motivation. Are people motivated to, throughout to share their data, to invest the work, to make uh, it available to others, or is this still a cultural issue as well? It varies, but I do think it's changing, actually. Um, I mean, when we first uh, put out the policy, um, a lot people were concerned, and you know, some researchers said, oh, I couldn't possibly you know, share the data. But actually, you know, they get priority on the data, which, which often helps. And a lot of researchers are finding, they're finding new collaborators through the data. They're, they're, you know, they're actually getting a lot of benefit out of sharing it. So yes, in some cases, it can be quite a bit of effort. But I think, I think there's a definite shift. And also because funders and others are starting to really push that data shared, I think that's helping as well. So hi, I'm Steve Gardner, and um, I'm very old. I know I'm very old because in the bad old days of um, uh, structural bioinformatics in the millennium, I'd already been working in the field for about 15 years. <laughs> so I've got form. Um, I wanted to, I mean, one of the benefits of, of having been in the field for a little while is that you, you have a sort of back catalogue and you, you, know, you have some greatest hits that you can show. And I was preparing this and one of the things that, um, that came to mind was, uh, was actually this package. And it ties in very nicely with both of the themes of my talk and also some of the things that Benno was talking about. Um, I get, the more you spend, the more time you spend looking at data and how people use data and how you communicate amongst data, you get drawn to two particular issues or two fields of study. One is semiotics and the other is epistemology. And semiotics um, and epistemology make their way through most of the stuff that I've, I've done in my career. But back to Benno's point, um, one, of the f one of the first packages I, I designed in the space was a package called Chameleon. Actually, one of the very first where you could start to put up colored multiple sequence alignments and move blocks of sequences around interactively. And then the notion was that you would actually have multi-levels of um, information displayed, and those would be uh, connected by context. So highlights would always move across between the different displays. So you had structure, which of course you could move independently, but if you highlighted bits on here, uh, little prediction profiles would update. And that was a principle of being able to use all of the data that were available to you in a single set of visualizations to answer a whole bunch of questions at the same time. And I think that talks nicely to what we can do with multi-dimensional, um, multi-level sets of data inside the very large knowledge graphs that we're collecting at the moment. So move the clock on a little. And um, I got into the business of pulling extremely large knowledge graphs together. Um, so this is an example of uh, a series of data sources that we, um, that we mined to pull out, in this particular case, about um, a network with about 10 million nodes, um, which had in the region, uh, those nodes were connected at an upper ontology level um, by about 2,000 different um, relations. So a very, very detailed, nuanced description of essentially the entirety of the available knowledge. So all of the unstructured data sets, 
from scientific literature, patent literature, clinical uh, data sets, disease databases, all of the genomics, proteomics, uh, chemistry databases, um, gene ontology as was in the day, um, and then another whole bunch of proprietary stuff. So we were working with a major pharma company and we had access to all of their internal data as well. So all of their tox studies, animal studies, clinical reports, uh, screening data, and all their internal documents, PowerPoint presentations, Excel sheets, uh, Word docs, um, telephone directories, electronic publication records, and we turned the whole lot into a huge graph. So then the question becomes, how can you make that graph usable and what can you do with it? And we set up a series of visualizations to try and avoid the hairball, which I absolutely hate. And uh, you know, I think everybody here should be avoiding that, if at all possible, because it, it doesn't really communicate anything. So we set up these kind of star views of a particular entity or set of entities at the center of our, our point of interest. And we represented information surrounding them as a series of connected points on a graph. Of course, that gets you so far. You can roll over these and you can get tool tips on what they are. You can filter them. You can screen them. You can do a whole bunch of things. But what we, just to highlight some other principles of what we did, um, we were also doing uh, what I call resolution demapping, which is basically allowing people to look at sets of informations in, in different ways. So the obvious thing here is that we faceted them by some, some parameter. I can't even remember what it was at the time, uh, now. But the interesting thing that that hides, going back to the semiotics, is that this is definable by the user. So there's a single knowledge graph, but the way in which you use that knowledge graph is going to be contextual for the individual who's actually doing the analysis. You may have more or less interest in a particular set of connections or a particular set of data. You may have more or less confidence, epistemology, in a set of data. And so we allow people to set up semantic lenses that described their personal, their personal level of interest onto these data. And we allowed them to project those onto this very large network so that you could actually find things that were intuitive to you as the user and that were of interest to you as the user. And that, that as a principle is something that I think we need to do um, in order to be able to make sense of very large sets of data. The other thing that we need to do is to be able to throw them out into appropriate visualizations. So we had a whole bunch of helper applications. If you're dealing with chemical structure, you want a chemical structure viewer. If you're dealing with um, uh, I can't even remember what these are, but you need a, you know, you need Spotfire to sit in the background and, and do some decent visualization for you. This is 2004, by the way, pre-BioJS. So, fast forward again. Um, those very large networks are still at play, and actually the problem's got a lot worse. So, here's Albert. Albert's actually my wife's, uh, he's my father-in-law. Um, that isn't Albert, he's just not that good looking. <laughs> Albert has hypercholesterolemia, he has asthma, he has hypertension, he has atrial fibrillation and he has gout. Poor old bugger. He's lived a life. The problem with Albert is he's now costing us a huge amount of money because you know, we're having to treat all of these conditions and he keeps ending up going to hospital. Falls down in the street and gets accused of uh, being drunk by my mother-in-law. Um, and that's a side effect of his medication. So now we come into the problem of moving systems biology into a healthcare arena where you have seven billion genotypes, seven billion sets of environmental factors, seven billion sets of um, lifestyle data, all of which are having an impact on how medicines are used and how effective they are. And this is a huge problem. The disease burden um, in the US for just seven conditions, seven chronic disease conditions, is going to be four trillion dollars by 2020. Now that isn't just a big number, that's something that defines our ability as a society to deliver health 
and our ability to afford to deliver health. That's more than we spend on education, defence, um, actually it's about as much as we spend on social care. It's a huge burden on society. And part of that is because the way that we treat people is not, is not very optimal. Um, we give people lots of different drugs and they have lots of different effects. And they have lots of different effects in interaction with each other and in interaction with our genome and with our lifestyle and with our environment. So poor old Albert, all he wants to know is what side effects should he expect? If he sees any of them, should he go to his GP or not? And what is it safe for him to eat? And they're very simple, very pertinent questions that go to the heart of our ability to deliver medicine that is effective in society. Now, answering those questions is actually fairly challenging. Um, at one level, you've got to have an entire systems pharmacology model. You've got to understand the entirety of all of the targets, all of the receptors, all of the transporter systems that operate in the body, the genome, how uh, in chronic diseases the, um, uh, the, the polygenic nature, the highly heterogeneous, uh, the high heterogeneity um, with multi -lo multiple low penetrance variants exerting their effects in combination in a particular individual, plus all of those environmental and lifestyle and clinical history Things, so the comorbidities, co-prescriptions, how they all impact on Albert. Because Albert's the guy we care about for the purposes of this conversation. So we've been building systems that allow us to go through and solve some of the MP hard problems that are associated with predicting the behavior of complex systems. And inevitably we do it by cheating. But we cheat in a really interesting way. So we have systems that combine logic and geometry that allow us to look through those hyperdimensional networks very, very quickly to define essentially a hyperplane through that complex hyperdimensional space that only contain potential solutions that match some external constraints that we put on the system. A really, a really simple way of thinking about this is a railway system, classic MP hard AI problem. You've got, you know where all the stations are, you know where the tracks are, you know where the trains are, you've got all the points, you've got all of the signals. How do you define the best um, routing map and timetable to get everything to move from A to B as quickly as and efficiently as possible? And the short answer is you don't do it using stats and you don't do it using machine learning for two different reasons. One is it's computationally not very efficient. And secondly, because the, um, the shortcuts you take throw away valid solutions. Now, if you tra translate railway system to nuclear power plant, that gives you a real problem, as it does in medicine. So we basically have ways of cutting through that massive, you know, let's say 10 to the 1,000 possible combinations of all of those parameters and identifying in a single geometric twist, one single operation, we find the thousand valid solutions and then we can go and price all of those. Then we can apply object functions to those to get the thousand, to get the cost and the benefits of those in those thousand solutions. And that's what we're doing for Albert. So Albert wants answers to those questions. Here's Albert's profile. Apologies if this is a little bit low. Here's the drugs he's on, here's the diseases he's on. You'll notice this is on a mobile phone. Albert wants to know for a particular basket of food that he's uh, got in his online shopping, which ones are likely to be beneficial, which ones are likely to be detrimental to, to his particular set of circumstances. So the mobile phone has the entirety of that systems pharmacology model sat behind it. And now we're trying to reduce that complexity to things that Albert can understand. So we go through that set of products and we have something literally as simple as a traffic light. Here's the stuff in red that causes Albert with his particular set of medications real problems. Here's the set of stuff that he ought to be wary of. 
And because we can also look at all of the other products on Tesco shelves, look at their ingredients and check those for potential issues with Albert, we can also give him a series of recommendations to say, actually, you know what? Alcohol is not very good for you, Albert. You keep falling down the street and you get hit by two before by your mother and by your uh, wife. Um, why not buy the alcohol-free stuff? It won't make your blood pressure um, spikes any better, but it might stop you getting beaten up. Um, the key point about this also is that all of this, it's computationally efficient enough to happen on the phone. So none of this sits on a server. We don't have Watson in the background. I don't have a thousand node supercomputer sat somewhere computing paths through the, um, through the network. What I have is basically a whole series of lookups running in JavaScript on the phone in milliseconds that does this stuff. That gives us huge opportunities for visualizing complex data. And I think we have to start thinking of slightly different ways like this. This is an analogy of how to move forward with breaking through some of the complexity that we're dealing with to be able to deliver information that actually makes a difference to the person who's looking at it and be able to do that with all of the context at multiple levels at the same time. And I think if I frame any particular challenges for you, I would go this way. There's a lot of money in this space and um, it's, a, it's an extremely um, societally beneficial thing to be working on. Thank you. My name is uh, James King, and I run a, a small design consultancy called Science Practice. And my colleague here is uh, Marek Kultis. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, Adrian, who um, actually did most of the organization of the panel and, and, and did all the emails to arrange people to come and speak here, asked Marek and I to come and ask some questions um, and maybe lead the panel discussion part. So that's what we're here to do. Um, we're going to ask uh, three, three questions, really, and then just open it up to, to, to questions from the floor. Um, and I'll just give a bit of warning of what the questions are so people can start thinking of answers. Um, but the, the first question is really about different user needs. So us being designers, we're, we're constantly thinking about who we're designing for and what they need, and therefore how we should design the thing that we're designing. And I think what's interesting is that there are different user needs for each of these um, uh, different sections of the industry. So um, uh, Will, Parthadban and Adrian are all in, in some ways servicing the research community. So they're creating tools for researchers to better do their jobs. Um, Rebecca is really helping those researchers then disseminate their findings in the most efficient and effective way, um, which you may disagree or agree with that. That'd be interesting. Um, and uh, Steve, the, the, the kind of the, the, especially the last part of your talk, you were talking about the, the, the kind of the real endpoint of that data, which is in this case uh, really affecting uh, the lives of patients and, and clinicians and making healthcare a bit more efficient and a bit more effective. So really that's where the meaning kind of comes into its fullest form. Um, so we'll ask uh, maybe a few questions around that. Um, the second set of questions, or the second question is really about um, the challenges uh, that uh, each of the individual speakers brought up. Um, and probably the largest challenge is just due to complexity. We're all aware that biological data is inherently complex. Um, and so we'll be talking about that. And then uh, the, the third question is really going to be about the future of biological um, visualization, maybe with relation to BioJS as well, and where maybe um, the BioJS community could, could, could take a lead in terms of what to, what to focus on next. So those are the three general questions. So I'll start with the, the first one. Um, and uh, I think um, that's really probably just to, to, to start maybe with Rebecca and go down, um, down the line. But how would you characterize your, your, the, the end user that you're designing for? And what do you think the primary need is that they, they have? Um, and maybe how do you establish those needs? So um, do, you, do you talk to them? Uh, do you do user research, that kind of thing? And maybe what are the things that you found out that were maybe surprising about what you thought they needed and what they actually needed? Um, so that's a bit of a long-winded question, but um, I'll pass the microphone down. OK. So. Um 
I'd, I'd say that we probably have a, a number of users, really. I mean, yes, the, the authors are one of the users, but actually one of the bigger users is really the readers and as part of that, the referees, and the whole discussion then carries on from there. Um, the authors, in a way, are, are more complex. I mean, it partially goes to the point that was raised earlier in terms of, you know, there is a risk as an author because you are opening up your data and you are allowing people to play with it and go, but hang on a minute, what it, you know, you've ignored that and you've deliberately cut that out and you've you know, analysed it a certain way, it shows this view, but why don't you look at it that way? So the, there are complexities as an author. Uh, I think you know, it, it, it is requiring to some extent groups like publishers and funders and others to push and encourage authors and to also wave you know, carrots at the end that you may get, as I mentioned earlier, collaborators and other things out of it as a benefit. Um, I think the big benefit really is from the ongoing uh, potential discussion and, and analysis and you know, the, the replication and all those kind of issues that come for the readers and for the referees um, to be able to really play with it because, you know, it's all fine having the data there, but if you can't really quickly play with it, everybody is very short on time. If you can't quickly play with it and, and you know, assess what's in there um, and, in fact, play with it and discover something new and that leads on to the next thing, you know. Um, yeah. So what were the other questions um, following for that? I think that's that covers it. <laughs> so just to summarize, I mean, I think you're saying really um, sort of speed and uh, uh, ease really is, is one of the things because replicating studies, looking at the data is difficult and, and, uh, and time consuming anyway. So speed is probably one of the primarily yes. primary things. Yeah, yeah. Just quickly. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it, to really replicate it, you are going to pull it off and you're going to use your own tools and all the rest of it. But it's being able to get a quick sense, does this look right? And then you can do further analysis if you decide it's interesting enough. Um, I don't know. Uh, probably one, one angle that we like to look at, I don't know, user requirements, what our user, what our target audience wants, is um, we want to offer them very simple tools. and. Uh, coming from a research background and talking, ev building tools for researchers, most of the time researchers and, I don't know, scientists, let's say, they want everything and more than everything. I mean, I don't know, show me a lot more. And, I don't know, I'm a bit stubborn and I'm like trying to simplify all these things. So one of our approaches, like, trying to make things as simple as possible and trying to start delivering just the sufficient information. And even if that particular bit of information is like not exhaustive enough or there are some information missing, I think it's still a lot useful. So I think we also, we also see ourselves like, uh, we see ourselves that we have to educate our, our users of you know, changing a bit their habits of, you know, like, we, we don't want to design dash, uh, dashboards that look like a fighter jet cockpit, right? I, I will start in showing, like, free statistics. If we, if we did our research and we consider that these are the starting point, we'll start from there and then we'll see how we can add more information. So, basically, what, what we try to do is, like, trying to educate the, um, our target audience, saying them, look, what about this? Is this sufficient for you? If you need something more than that, let us know and then we, we, we'll think about it. So trying to simplify simplify the design, that's one of the... Do you find that eventually the, the trend towards simplicity sinks in or do you, do you find that it's still, you have some still stubborn people that you're working with that, uh, sorry, they may be in the room, that, um, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that are still kind of tending towards the, no, show me everything, I need the complexity, I need to... Uh, I think there will always be stubborn people, and uh, I, I'm one of them. Uh, but, you know, like, um, we'll design a particular product, we'll put it on there. There will always be people that like it, people that don't like it. It's our duty to listen to both of them and to, to take it from there. But I, our strategy is to start with something very minimalistic and see how we can, how we can improve that. So, yeah. Uh, that's a very interesting question. So, um, 
we develop software uh, for uh, research uh, community and before um, uh, venturing into anything you know developing something we ask a couple of simple questions the first question is uh, what problem are we trying to solve or um, are we trying to solve a problem at all yeah so by having a software or a visualization tool or, or any component so uh, we keep asking this question over and over again uh, because if it doesn't solve a customer's problem then they don't want it you know even if it's a great software the second uh, question we ask ourselves um, and also trying to answer this question over and over again is um, is it better faster and cheaper or cheaper so um, it has to be uh, better um, and um, or faster uh, and it has to add significant uh, improvements or advantages to our customer and ideally um, it has to be cheaper uh, so um, for example I can give you a very simple example so the customer may be using um, a desktop software for visualization uh, that solves the problem and then the customer does not want anything else and if we have a JavaScript component like BioJS for visualization, and they probably don't need it, yeah. So then we have to prove uh, the case that you know why this is better or faster, or or is it is it or, or is it solving a problem uh, that their software already can't solve, yeah. So these two are the simple questions that we keep answering over and over again, yeah. So space, I'd <coughs> I'd like to. <coughs> On me, approach this in a slightly different way of, of, of thinking of, of how is the field changing in research? How is, how is molecular biology fundamentally changing at the moment and pharmaceutical R&D changing at the moment? And one of the things that's increasingly clear is it's becoming in, more and more information driven than, say, purely hypothesis driven. So very often you'll have these large data sets and the informaticians will be analyzing and processing these large data sets looking for the signals in these data sets and those signals will then get handed over to some sort of analyst to try to make sense of. And what I see is, is visualization as having this absolutely key role <clears throat> is in providing the context for the sort of signals that are coming out of these information driven data mining type of experiments. Um, and so it's, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's about, about making things simpler so much as making things being very mindful of the context and being able to put all of the information that an analyst needs to interpret a particular uh, uh, biological signal uh, in front of them in a, in a way that makes sense to them so I think that's the you know the, the, the importance of visualization is increasing as we move to more more of this information driven approach and what we need to do is just to find better ways of making sure that the right information is provided to, 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 to the user in, in, in the right way. Uh, so, uh, in that light, how would you define the differences between uh, visualizations that serve the purposes for discovery and those that serve the purposes of, uh, of communication of discoveries done previously? So I think that you're right that there is a difference between the, the presentation of information for discovery and the presentation of information for communication. I'm much more interested and my, 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 my users and the, and, the, and the people that we, su we, we, we support are much more interested in visualization for discovery rather than visualization for communication. So I'm gonna dodge that and say, visualization for communication, I don't care. <laughs> I care deeply about it. <laughs> um, actually, that's that's one of the transitions that I found uh, most interesting in moving away from a purely research-led community into communities who want to use the results of that research and particularly to contextualize them for a particular problem that they have right in front of them, even if that problem is a is a patient or is the management of their own their own health. And I think you, the discipline in, in trying to do that is, is trying to, to bring enough rigor behind the selection of information that you provide behind the scenes that you adhere to the highest level of professional standards and you don't take so many shortcuts when you come into the visualization with what can appear to be a very simplistic 
interface such as you just saw there with simple traffic lights. The, the challenge for me is, is always to have multiple dimensions of data available for those users who do want to go in and do want to learn more from, uh, you know, who want to drill down, who feel motivated to do that. Because, you know, in this specific context, we want them to become educated. We want them to become engaged as a partner in managing their own health. To do that, we need to break down the notion that an MD is a medical deity sat on a, pe a pedestal dispensing knowledge from on high. We need everybody to understand their own diseases better. Now, nobody, you know, 70-year-old bloke, Albert, he's not going to become a, you know, a, a medical doctor or a PhD in whatever to, to understand that. So you have to be able to be faithful to the available information and all of the science behind the scenes. But be able to, to represent it at different levels that are appropriate to communicating its value for the decision making of the patient or person. It might be a, might be a pharmacist, in which case you've got different data, dietitian, different set of data, prescribing clinician, you've got a different set of data. Um, so being able to use the single substrate, but present different interfaces that talk to the needs of those separate sets of users, to me is incredibly important. Um, so this is a sort of second question, um, which is uh, about the, the challenges of complexity in the data. So visualization is, um, uh, is great because it adds constraints about what you can and can't show. You only have two dimensions on the screen. You can maybe cheat and add a third dimension, um, but it's still a really 2D representation that people are seeing. Um, that means you have to make choices about what you show and what you don't show in multi-dimensional data. Um, Really, how do you decide about what to put in and what to take out? This is, a, I guess, probably quite a simple question, and it's very, very context dependent. But um, I'm going to ask it anyway and <laughs> pass it down. Sorry, Rebecca. OK, I, get, I mean, I guess we come from it from a different angle. But um, really, we rely on the research community to decide what are the best things to include and not include rather than us as publishers and that's one of the reasons why I say you know I think it's important that publishers don't build these things because it shouldn't be us that's that's deciding that we need the research community in different areas to agree what are the main things that they you know that that need to be shown um, that are most important really I, I think this question kind of ties nicely into what uh, Steve was saying about like having this hierarchical way of exploring the data. So, so I think it ties very nicely into the, the way of, of visualizing data hierarchical because as you, as you mentioned, it's like you have a 2D, maximum 3D or whatever, so way of visualizing it. And it's, it's basically drilling down from one level of information from higher level, going digging deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, how to do it, I think it's really depending a lot on what kind of uh, information you are dealing with and what messages do you want to uh, to uh, to deliver i mean again it's probably you'll you'll you will do it differently if it's about communicating um, some known uh, i know not not known but um, um, some yeah so communication and research so i think it it's, it's it depends on all that but i think like uh, trying to put everything in these two dimension probably it's, it's not the way and like thinking of smart ways of drilling down that that will be at least my my approach of dealing with the problem yeah this this again goes back to my original thing you know like, um about you know is it helping someone to make a decision you know like a, whether it's 2D or 3D, uh, or, or if it's 3D, would they have taken a decision differently, or does it so, uh, showing something useful or, or better or something like that? You know, uh, I, I can give you a very simple example. So I, I showed a multiple sequence alignment and a proper alignment JavaScript based to a customer, and then um, I showed the same thing in in a text file, in a, in a uh, FASTA file, in a in a, in a Vim editor, and then they said, "Oh, that's great! You know, that looks better." <laughs> so I, then I thought, uh, "It's it's a static, you know, text file, so I can open it in my machine." But what I'm showing is is like interactive. So um, basically, um, 
the, the text file actually in that case you know solved a solved a very simple problem for the customer. It, it's very simple, yeah. So, uh, so that, then that the question is, are we solving a problem by having a shiny interface or or a three D or or advanced interfaces? That's one problem. The second biggest problem we are dealing with is uh, the massive data. So it doesn't matter, you know, like 2D or 3D. So can we actually load the data, massive amount of data, and then show at least something? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that the genome browsers have been done this fairly well over the past sort of over a decade, and and really that how you decide what to present to the user when you've got a very large data set. I mean, so clearly you need to have some concept of semantic zooming. You know, you need to be able to sort of zoom all the way out and get an overview of your data set. You need to zoom in to get a very detailed view of a very specific part of your data set. And the information that you're presented at each level needs to be adjusted accordingly, clearly. Um, the other, it's sort of the other interesting uh, sort, of, sort of thing about the, the other interesting sort of advance in, 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 in delivering information is this, uh, the, this idea of visual analytics. The idea to, you know, that you can you can uh, interactively control parameters using things like sliders and see things actually happening on the display as you're doing that. And I think Steve spoke to some of those sort of points in early in, early in his talk, that the way that you can kind of link up these dimensions and have them interrelated and you can sort of manipulate them together. I think those are the 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 the, the kind of the technologies that are that that, that are needed, and. The more these web technologies develop, the things like BioJS develop, I think the richer the suite of tools that we're going to have, to, you know, be able to use to present these sorts of data sets to, 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 the, to the end users are going to increase. Thanks. It's, it's a paraphrase of an interesting question that was put to me many, many years ago by Peter Murray Rust. And he, he was um, working at GSK at the time, and he was talking about the billion data point problem. You know, we're about to launch high throughput screening and we're going to have all these assays and all of these compounds and we're going to have data on all of them. And how do I put a billion data points on a screen at, at a given you know, point in time because I don't have a billion pixels? And I come back to semiotics and um, epistemology as a, as a design pattern for thinking through that. The, the key point about semiotics, I mean, obviously there's, a, there's the object that you're interested in, there's the um, sign or the representation that you're using, the visualization that you're using to represent it. But the key thing in that is the observer. And understanding the observer, and particularly what it takes for them to understand the point that you're trying to make, it's epistemology, is critical to the decisions that you make about how you, how you design this stuff. Now, I'm going to use a very different example. I mean, I've done traffic lights here. They're, they're the simplest thing you can possibly do. We also work in, um, in retail analytics. So we're, doing, uh, we're developing visual ontologies to enable real-time deduction of um, attention metrics um, through gaze tracking and microfacial encoding, um, so emotional response to a particular piece of digital content or a visual scene. And we're using it to evaluate store layouts, supermarket store layouts, of all things. <laughs> the stuff you do for money, hey? Um, and uh, it's really interesting because a key concept there is that in a store, you can blast people with offers left, right, and center. But all you're doing is increasing the cognitive burden that you ha that, that individual experiences when they go around a shop. And so simultaneously, you make it harder to find what they're actually looking for because you haven't contextualized it, you haven't personalized it. Um, and you make the experience of shopping actually much harder. And it, the, the process of trying to find data in hyperdimensional, multi-level data sets is very, very similar to that basic challenge. So it's our job as designers, I think, to try and get out of the way as much as, as possible of any data or any visualizations that are going to be, um, uh, that are going to be detrimental to, to the user understanding that. If you go back to Tufty, that was one of his key things. You only put pixels on the page that contribute to communicating what you, what you want the user to see. 
last question before we open it up. Um, so everyone, I think, talked a little bit about the challenges um, that, that uh, visualization is facing. Um, and maybe I could just ask everyone to s elaborate on those slightly. Um, but in terms of thinking about the future of visualization and maybe the future of BioJS, um, if, if you're familiar enough with it to do so. Um, so, uh, Will, one of the things you mentioned was now's the right time for new types of visualizations. We're moving towards graph genomes rather than than um, the, the older paradigms. Um, Parthaban, you also said that we need we need new types of ways of visualizing new data and old data as well. So maybe you could elaborate on 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 what those things might be. Um, Another kind of meta question, maybe alongside that, is how much of a role can visualization actually play? I mean, if these data sets are so large and so complex, um, is boiling them down to what's human perceivable even the right thing to be doing? Or could we, again, well, cheating slightly, I know you went to an AI and genomics um, uh, talk a few, a, few, a few weeks ago, but should we really be designing for AIs to analyze this data for us rather than relying on what our brains can do? Um, and lastly, imaging is getting quite a lot better. So it's now possible um, to, uh, to use microscopes to actually see living systems in real time. Um, so that the, I'm thinking of the work of Eric Betzig uh, more recently, um, just put a microscope on it and see what's happening. Is, is that a, a better shortcut to, to, to doing this kind of data analysis and, and revisualizing something which you could maybe look at more directly? Um, so set of questions broadly about the future, um, go. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, you know one of the things I talked about, obviously, in terms of challenges, is, that is there is such a huge range of different types, and from a publisher, it's a it's a real problem in terms of you know enabling those different uh, types uh, of visualization and and the manpower and the, the cost of doing it. And so, I think the you know I think the BioJS is is fantastic in that it's starting to build you know some standards around all these kind of issues, and I think publishers also need to get together and from uh, from that end build some standards to make it more manageable and so to enable it to be much more broadly uh, usable. Um, I think there's an uh, interesting point which touched actually a little bit on on the previous point about um, about how do you decide what to visualize, and actually from the 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 display point of view, you know, the authors have a specific thing that they want to show and the way they want to show the data. But actually, I think it's quite important if you look at the other end for the readers and for the referees and, and you know, other people looking at it to not restrict it because that's where you actually find something interesting and new is actually you look at it in a different way. And so it's, it's how you balance those two. I think it's a complex issue. Yeah. So. I, I think here you can kind of focus on a lot a lot of things like I mean you can think how we can develop super cool and super uh, n super good visualization things how you deliver this how you put all things together so I, I, I think it's a broad a broad field what what, what I would like to uh, focus on is more like um, thinking about the delivery mechanism I mean like what I mean, who is going to use the tool that you are developing, and like how are they going to use that? And I mean, like who is your target audiences? And I, I, I want to make a parallel with Bioconductor because that I, I spend a lot of time there. And Bioconductor, as a library of bioinformatics tool, was very good. And I mean, like the Bioconductor guys did a great job. But in my opinion, they miss a point in which like, there is this cool set of library, but a clinician can't use it. I mean, like a, a guy in a white coat that really needs to, to, ext to, to use that piece of information, he needs pro training in programming and understanding those things. So it's a very cool library and probably one of the most comprehensive things for geeky people or whatever scientists and I mean don't take that badly but the problem what they missed is like how you deliver those libraries those tools tools and I think like for for the BioGS community it's like it, it's a very I, I, I would like you guys to think about that like am I building this tool for like 
other 50, 100 researchers that are interested in like developing those methods or am I building this tool for like uh, a clinician? I want that tool to be, I want my piece of code to be used on the phone just like that or, so think, think about what's the delivery mechanism. And in my opinion, the delivery mechanism today and probably it will, it will be for the next few years will be is browsers, web browsers, mobile devices and so on and so forth. So if you build something, it doesn't need to be ultra complicated. You don't need to be necessarily ultra innovative. You just need to make it useful for a large community. And that, that's, that's for me one, one of the biggest challenge. Um, you mentioned all the tools, etc., that exist in Bioconductor R. Um, there's beginning to be some ways of, you know, making R into a, putting a web interface in front of R with the shiny packages, etc. Um, do you think that that could be an alternative way forward, you know, improving use of Bioconductor through R shiny on the web, rather than trying to re-implement similar things? in JavaScript, or are there additional challenges which make JavaScript a, a better approach? Uh, again, I, I think, I, I mean, absolutely, you're right. So, and, but as you pointed out, it's like they start thinking about how to deliver that particular content via Shiny. And I mean, the RStudio guys did a great job of, you know, implementing a, implementing a reactive mechanism such that you use R as a backend and then you use the browser as the delivery. But I think the point is still like, it doesn't matter in what kind of language or what kind of environment your tool is designed or implemented, it can be C, can you do it in assembler if you like. The, you, you need to think about who am I building this for? Right, so I mean like you need to think about the endpoint. Who, who is going to, to use this particular tool? And I think like that the more we think about like, oh, you know, like I want to build this piece of software because I just want to publish it, then probably that's not, I mean, you know, you, you, you don't think about who is going to, to, to benefit from it. I mean, how, how, how is your piece of software going to impact society? It doesn't matter really in what you build it, it's like how, how are you going to, to deliver it there? If you, if you come up with the complete package, then probably that's, that's a winner. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with uh, Adrian. Um, so, and also, um, in my opinion, uh, a, a proper documentation and, and test cases and also uh, finding the customer needs is uh, uh, very useful. Um, I can give you an example. For example, uh, long ago someone showed me like they dragged a like a uh, BAM file and and tried to load it in JavaScript and and I think in ByJS or something and it loaded. Yeah. So in reality, a customer or or a, a typical person uh, doing this is very very minimal because most of these BAM files uh, reside in remote server. They don't reside in uh, in their desktops. And then these are massive files. And usually, they can't be copied to the desktop as well. So uh, there's no infrastructure, physical infrastructure in place that can make this happen. So ideally, um, there is a backend that reads this file, which may be written in R or Java or whatever, and then sends only tiny amount of data uh, to the front end, which is the customer. Uh, having a desktop somewhere else in the internet, uh, and then who can uh, pull the data from the server and then show the data in the server. So that this comes down to, once again, uh, identifying the real need and also um, uh, having a test case. You know, When you try to load um, a FASTA file and show a multiple sequence alignment, and then you might have tested it in 10 sequences, and then the customer might be loading like 10,000 sequences. So at that time, you know, both the browser uh, cannot handle, the customer may not uh, have a proper desktop or a powerful hardware. In addition to that, the browser may, may not uh, handle this much amount of data, or, or the JavaScript itself cannot, may not be able to ha handle this much of am amount of data. And in most cases, we, we are increasingly seeing that, you know, like NHS is still using Windows XP or something like that. So if your customer is uh, having like a very poor hardware throughout their infrastructure, then you have to understand what they actually use it for. And in, yeah. So <clears throat> I think as well as 
trying to look at the current issues and how we solve the current problems with the visualization uh, solutions that we're, we're providing now, I think it's also quite useful to start thinking ahead and start thinking about the, the problems that are coming up due to the changing nature of biological and molecular data that aren't at all solved with the current visualization approaches. So this whole thing about the, the, the genome graphs and, this, and, and, and that change and how we're going to, how we're going to solve that. And that's much, this is much more of a, a conceptual problem than a technical implementation problem. And I think that, that this conceptual problems that in terms of how this, how this information could be presented, what the biological community, community needs to do is to probably look beyond the biological community, looking more towards the, the data science community and the data visualization community as a whole and saying, you know, you know the biological community can't be the first people that have come across large networks and hairballs. How are other communities solving these? What are other, what, what, what are other approaches? What, what's being taken elsewhere? And so I kind of, you know, that's, that's what, I, what, what I would really encourage is, is for, for, for people to be very aware of what's going on elsewhere in terms of, uh, in terms of solving, these, in terms of solving these, these, these very pressing problems in, in, in uh, molecular biology. So I'm going to pick up on a point that Will made uh, in the last question. And actually, I don't think visualization is the problem. I think the integration of visualization and search functionality is the problem. So when you do the visual analytics, what you're aiming to do is to be able to find the things to visualize that you actually want to take you to the next level of understanding. And I think that is where a lot of the visualizations that we have at the moment fall down because they effectively present a fairly static view and then being able to transition from one view to the next is actually quite difficult. And when you're talking about doing detection of you know, critical subnodes in a, in a cluster that connect um, subclusters together and act as hotspots inside your network, that's not something that you're going to get off a little list of facets of properties that you can do in tick, tick boxes in a, in a JavaScript interface. You know, we have to have much more sophisticated and much better integrated search capabilities to allow us to move seamlessly between those, um, between the sets of data that we're actually wanting to look at. So if I could come back on that very quickly. If we're thinking about faceted searching, we could do an, do an awful lot better than we do already in the biological community. We could become a lot more like some of the big e-commerce sites that do a really good job of faceted searching. A huge issue is the standardization of the data sets and the dimensions and ontologies and metadata and all these other good things, which again, you know, are absolutely crucial to support these sort of advanced visualization techniques, but are really not been properly addressed in terms of the, the, the community as a whole. Can I come back on that? <laughs> <laughs> so a really interesting way of looking at that, and I, I mentioned the visual analytics uh, sort of as a, a halfway lead into that. One of the things that you have to be able to do is not to have a defined ontology in order to allow you, you don't have to be, de sorry, if you are dependent on having defined ontologies for all of the attributes that you ever want to search, you're going to be sorely disappointed for a whole variety of different reasons. And I've spent 20 odd years of my life developing ontologies and ontologies of ontologies and God knows what. It's, it's a painful old business and I don't envy the publishers in, in this because they, they get a lot of data from a lot of people that really needs an awful lot of normalization. So what I've done more recently is started working on arbitrary descriptions of domains or spaces which can be defined by hyperdimensional semantic vectors. So I'm using sparse pattern matching techniques to allow me to not predefine what those attributes may be, but allow them to emerge from the data themselves. And those attributes that keep reappearing in things that people are interested in naturally get get weighted up. Now, it doesn't mean that they always have explanatory power, but it, what it does mean is I can find things that look like other things that I'm interested in. And that, I think, is a very powerful technique that we can start to bring into some of this, as well as the more defined editorial kind of uh, scripted features that come from formal ontologies. 
I'd like to add a few things. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just forgot to mention another thing. Um, until recently, I mean, this is in the healthcare diagnostics world. Um, um, until recently, um, what or, or even now, what we are doing uh, is that we have uh, diagnostic instruments that generate a lot of data, and then clinicians visualize it instantly in their desktop. So anyone who develops a software for that purpose uh, ha have a, like a defined time window within which they have to show the results. It can be JavaScript, it can be desktop software, and so on. So so far that has been the case. Yeah, but it is slowly uh, um, moving in a slightly different way for various reasons. One of the reasons is that genomic data or, or any omic data is getting bigger and bigger. So it's not possible to have it uh, in a, in a clinician's desktop anymore. So um, we have to have it in the cloud or, or somewhere else. But we have to visualize it in the clinician's desktop within a short uh, time window. Uh, so the uh, pre-compute is, uh, is uh, essential. And also uh, you know, transferring this data, visualizable data, back to a clinician's desktop is uh, um, essential as well nowadays. So that's where I think the future is going on. You know. So don't do everything locally, but you can do remotely, and you can use technology to visualize things that are run remotely. Um, I just re re been reminded that the final part of your question was about real-time um, uh, imaging to look, for example, at um, the distribution and excretion of, of medicines through the body. There are actually some really interesting developments in that space. So you, you're starting to see. The, the challenge is that the half-life of, um, I think it's fluorine that they use at the moment, um, is about 20 minutes. And it, it doesn't allow um, particularly effective um, PET scanning is what they, what they use to, to look for distribution. But we're starting to see bedside, um, what do you call the, uh, oh, never mind, the, the, um, the little toroidal uh, nuclear things that, yeah, I can't remember the name from. Sorry? No. Uh, no, not centrifuge. Um, I want to say. Yeah, no, it is, it is, sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've been out of this space for about four years. So, uh, um, But you're starting to see the bedside development of um, systems that can label carbon atoms. Um, and that gives you, it means that you have a decent amount of time to get the labeled compounds that you're interested in, which are the drug compounds, not fluorinated versions of the drug compounds, which changes massively the, um, the ADME profile associated with them and therefore you can actually see the, the compounds themselves properly distributing through the body with a decent PET scanner. So I, I think that kind of stuff will, uh, will also play a significant part. We have, um, we have a little bit left in the session, so time for questions from the floor. So hands up if you have a question. And I think rather than hand this round, we'll just, if you just shout. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think I think the point that was being made of uh, framing framing these uh, the problems that we're trying to solve uh, from the use from the end user rather than what we think people might be uh, might be looking for I think that's really really important uh, and it strikes me that you guys are really good uh, end users for us uh, to to kind of actually ask you guys so what real problems do you have uh, in terms of what we could help uh, develop in, in the biogenesis community. Specifically, we seem to have lots of individual components that we're starting to put together maybe in interesting ways, and you might see uh, a whole bunch of interesting ways that those things might fit together. So I'm thinking uh, maybe uh, asking you guys to, to sort of put together a use case of like, I would like to see um, you know, a PDB viewer with a multiple sequence alignment with uh, some feature thing in, in a shell with these requirements that have to run on Firefox, whatever. So that, that sort of thing, that would be incredibly useful for this community in terms of how we piece stuff together and how we have like, you know, gold standards in terms of development and, uh, and end, end users. So uh, I, I just wondered whether that was something that you could imagine uh, being part of. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can start with that. Uh, I know, like, I, I can start by thinking about, like, uh, what about 
thinking about that BioGS will become the next D3 for biological data in the sense that, you know, like, I don't need to go to, I don't know, like a Git repository and read all the documentation and try to understand the methods. I just want it, you know, like super simple. I just want to take that piece of code, embed it in my, uh, in my web application. It just displays something, right? So, I mean, like getting it to that like super easy, easiness of like using it. So that, that, that will be one thing that I, I, I would like to see. Um, I, I, I wouldn't go for now like thinking about more like, oh, I want to see a VCF viewer and so on and so forth. But another thing, think about like, do we have a set of modules that, I don't know, some, let's say one year experience JavaScript user doesn't know much about biology, reads a bit, and can assemble a genome browser. I mean, I know, Will, probably that's a very complicated thing, but I don't know, a simple, a simple genome browser. I mean, it doesn't need to be ensemble, but like, do we have that thing? I mean, can I, do I have a component that can show a track? Do I have a component that can show this and so on and so forth? So, such that, you know, like you start enabling like developers to create applications because like they will come from a different angle and they will start developing crazy things. Some of them will be rubbish, some of them will be brilliant. And it's, it's something that, you know, like when you are developing a particular visualization method, you don't really, you, you don't have the luxury to think about that, 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 that angle. That, that, that's how I, how, what I will see here. Victor gave a very special talk recently uh, on <coughs> media thinking that we did media lab in video. Talks about how new media may potentially have to think new thoughts. He gives the analogy that telescopes and microscopes can allow us to see colors that we can't see. We can see the unseeable now. And potentially new media may allow us to think the unthinkable. Do any of you have concrete examples of how the visualizations you've worked on have allowed us to think of questions that were previously impossible? or answer questions that were previously impossible, or think thoughts that were previously impossible. <laughs> I have a very tangible one, but it's not purely visualization. It's actually being able to pull the data together to find all the right data and then visualize it. So that um, middle, that very large network of, of information for a pharmaceutical company was used on a real project, and it was all about um, understanding the side effects of what was the best-selling drug on the planet at the time, um, Lipitor. And um, we were able, for the very first time, to pull all of the knowledge that was available about the domain. And it allowed us to see a pattern that was massively unintuitive. So we looked at the compounds that cause degradation of skeletal and cardiac muscle. And you would expect that those would be very similar. Actually, when you look at the data side by side, you can see an almost perfect anti-correlation. Compounds that cause one do not cause the other. And that is massively unintuitive. And you would never in a million years think of that being the answer to that question until you actually not only can compile that data, but can also visualize it. There's a very, there's a, there's a real significant difference in the way that, in the philosophy of science. And, you know, Will was alluding to the fact that we're becoming much less hypothesis driven and much more data led. Um, one of the th one of the things that I, I one of the consequences of having the availability of more information and the ability to visualize it is that I think opinion drops out of the mix a lot more. And you know I, these are all double-edged swords, but on the whole, I think that's actually I would like to see hypothesis and less opinion. What I'm getting is data and less opinion. So I'm you know I'm settling for a middle a middle ground here, but. I think the ability to actually answer questions in their entirety, rather than simply, you know, finding the first five hits on a Google page and then reading a couple of those papers and persuading ourselves that we actually understand what's going on, being able to take huge amounts of data as massive knowledge graphs, 
be able to mine them down to answer that question specifically should change the way that we think about science. Yeah, Manhattan plots. <laughs> like they, before the genome, it was not possible. Once you've got the genome, you've got everything in a locational context, you can put these things on a Manhattan plot, and the first thing people realised, this was the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium work, first thing they realised was, bloody hell, it's complicated. <laughs> um, and, and you pull all this stuff together and it, it just, it, it revolutionised people's understanding of complex disease and, 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 and continues to do so now. And that's through, I think, through a visualisation technique. Yeah. I mean, I personally uh, developed and benefited from visualisation in many cases. At the Sanger, Sanger Institute, uh, Sin, uh, we basically detected copy number and lots of other mutations. Um, uh, it was not JavaScript. It, it, it was also JavaScript. Uh, we used the Genovas uh, uh, browser, um, but we also used a lot of R plots. You know, like when I say lots, it's thousands. You know, so um, I pre-generated about a thousand R plots and gave it to a clinician who could go through each and every one of them. So I, I told them that this would take two to three hours, but they identified only a small set of things that are real. Uh, that would have been only possible by looking at them, not by uh, like an automated software that can detect them. Yeah. So uh, it took three hours, but it was doable, and it, it did the job, finally. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I want to... Um, so I, I think like what Steve said, it's, it's more about the bringing the, da the data together. So I think like, yes, there will be visualization tool that probably people will come up will need to come up with, but I think like what um, what will help us better understand and see new things is like uh, going from looking at one, five, ten samples to looking at so kind of decentralizing this and looking in a federated way across large cohorts and I mean like understanding some of the signals in the data will help us understand how to develop s some new visualization tools and so on. So I think like just understanding the data. And, and to add to that, I think um, things like being able to do the living figures where other groups can put their own attempt at replication on top of the original data. Say, you know, at the moment you have to read a paper, then you have to hope that you find the other papers that have tried to replicate it and read those and make your own sort of judgment, see whether it looks the same or doesn't look the same. Being able to see it in one figure and you immediately get a sense, is this reproducible or isn't it? They, they you know, could potentially have quite a big impact on, on understanding as well. So we're talking JavaScript web development. This world is moving so fast. If you find a nice library today, it will be outdated tomorrow. If you're still using jQuery, I pity you. <laughs> That's not that exactly true, but there's there's alternatives that are much faster and so forth. Anyway, uh, I met, and I love it myself. I, I find something new. I immediately use it on my code. But in industry, I imagine that that's a risk, and you have to be more careful. Uh, I'm just wondering about your thoughts about that. Uh, how careful are you? Do you actually spend time moving to new techniques, new languages, new libraries, or are you very, very conservative? You must have got quality. Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, when you're writing, when you're developing software, uh, any, any technology really, uh, new IDE, new library, uh, Atmosphere 6, for example, which is fantastic, we are using that. Uh, I mean, it, it's true that things are moving super fast, and yes, I believe that one needs to to stay up to date because otherwise, kind of you you, you start losing track of things. But um, I don't think that you you need to be like always the early adopter. And I think like most of the time, it's it's the concept that is more important than necessarily the technology that you are using, and I mean, like, if you design the things very modular, you can, I mean, you know, like, if you want to think about, like, front-end frameworks, right, uh, if, you, if you design a visualization tool in jQuery and you modularize that and it's not one function, so it's a 
set of functions, a nice library, then probably it will be very easy to pour that into something like Ember or Angular or whatever you, you want to use. So, I mean, like, the, the design and the architecture of that visualization module, I think it's more important than necessarily the, the current framework that you are using. And if you do that right, you, should be, you will be able to kind of port that rather easily. But yeah, it's true. I think like if you if you want to to be on the on the cutting on the I don't know like people to know you 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 kind of need to 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 be aware of this technology. There are some cases that I'm not spending too much time, but there are some cases where it might not be that easy. For example, moving from uh, callbacks to promises is sort of a big step. Uh, thinking about functional reactive programming, uh, which is just really nice. You usually want to, uh, it usually takes a bit more effort because it's more fundamental change. Agnostic 6 can be done virtually, I suppose. No, I, I understand your point. I, I, I think the payoff to move from one to the other, I mean, it, it pays off to do it. I mean, you don't need to do it right now, but you, you need to plan it. So, I mean, you. you. You you should you should see probably I will stay like six months one year behind this when things get a bit more stable but definitely I will do it. I wanted this back for two reasons. Firstly, to say cyclotron, which would have been much quicker. Um, but secondly, to say we we typically we keep a watching brief on new technologies and we do actively research them, but we wouldn't usually put them into production until they've been stable for a year or so and partly that's that's you know just protection from our side and the support side but actually it's also in some cases because the user base doesn't have the tech hasn't deployed the technologies that will actually support them fully depends on what it is but you know that's that's basically our rule of thumb i'd like to say from my from my perspective um uh, the commercial world is a very broad church and the world that we work in, which is predominantly discovery R&D, there's very little restrictions on exactly what technology you can use and how you implement it. I very much strongly suspect that as soon as you start getting to the clinical domain, as soon as you get to the healthcare, um, regulatory, patients, risk, obviously you're into a completely different world. So at one end of the spectrum, no. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, you probably want to be 20 years behind the curve. Well, you almost certainly are 20 years behind the curve. I don't want to be using IE6. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, I can answer this in a, in a, in a few simple questions. So, um, first we look for stability, you know, how stable it is, and it is well maintained, and also it has to be well maintained over a, a longer period of time in future. But the most important thing for us is how long does it take to implement the new technology? And then how long, how much time do we have to invest to, to keep it running over a long, longer period of time? You know, does it take only just a few hours to kind of replace the libraries and then use it with, with the available documentation? Or does it take days and days to kind of implement it and then spend, we have to kind of tweak it a lot uh, uh, in future as well. So the amount of time we need to invest to, to make it working and, and maintain in future, so that's. Yeah, and I guess we're led essentially by the researcher community. So if, if new technologies are being used, then um, then we will look at what it takes to provide the, the environment and everything else to enable that to run um, within the articles. But obviously there's a, there's a time delay anyway, because of course those tools have to have been developed in the first place. Um, that's it. Thank you so much um, to the speakers. Thank you to Adrian for, for organizing the speakers. And um, uh, I hope everyone found that interesting. Thank you very much.